This is American History TV's Lectures in History podcast. This week, a class on Asian immigration to the U.S. West Coast from 1830 to 1930, including the role of San Francisco Bay's Angel Island in the 20th century. Taught by University of Minnesota professor Erica Lee. This episode was recorded in 2015. Well, hello, guys. Welcome back. I'm really excited to talk to you today for our session this afternoon because so many of us as Americans, we grow up learning about the history of immigration through Ellis Island, right? This is what we talked about last week. It's the history of European immigrants coming to the new world under the shadow of the Statue of Liberty. It's often told as a very uplifting and romantic story where immigrants become Americans. But not many of us know the history of immigration through Angel Island. This is the immigration station in San Francisco. And it's an important site, not only for what happened back then in the early 20th century, but also because it's so timely today. It's timely because when we pick up any newspaper, we see headlines like this. This is just from last week. Republicans slam Obama's immigration town hall. Obama, I'll fight any attempt to reverse immigration action. Moving forward to fix our broken immigration system. House conservatives warn Boehner, don't cave on immigration. U.S. immigration dispute threatens security agency shutdown. Does anyone know what some of these headlines are referring to last week? What was the big debate in Congress? What was the proposed shutdown? Tiago. Yeah, um, they were proposing to shut down DHS funding because of Obama's executive action uh, referring to families. Right. So Obama's executive action that would protect millions of undocumented immigrants, undocumented immigrants, parents of undocumented immigrants who are um, parents of US citizens or legal residents, this would halt their deportation. But we know that uh, this is a, quite a controversial action right now. Um, governors of 26 states have sued the White House because they believe that this, this executive action exceeds the president's authority. At the same time, there's a judge in Texas who halted the immigration order, and this has created gridlock in Congress. Obama says he's going to continue to fight. He had a town hall in Miami that was um, sponsored by Univision, where he was talking about his, um, his commitment to reforming immigration laws. We know, because we've been studying immigration history for the past several weeks, that this is just the latest in our nation's immigration debates, but it does seem like it's a contracted one, um, and there doesn't seem to be an end in sight. So how do we consider this immigration debate with what we've been talking about most recently, immigration through Ellis Island? That story of European immigrants coming to New York, passing through Ellis Island. Certainly there were examinations, there were physicals, there was some detention, but it was primarily pretty short-lived and most immigrants were uh, admitted pretty easily into the country. And not only that, but this story has taken on a myth of its own. It really is the bedrock of this idea that the United States is a nation of immigrants, right? So how do we reconcile this great immigration debate that's going on today, and then this idea that, that we are a nation of immigrants. I think one of the ways that we can think about this complicated history of immigration is through looking at immigration through Angel Island. Because we know that not all immigrants were welcomed into the country, not all immigrants were able to achieve their American dreams, but rather we picked and sifted and chose which immigrants to let in and which immigrants to let out, to, to keep out. And many times this really um, was dependent upon an immigrant's race, ethnicity, gender, class, this idea of who is fit to become a citizen and who is not. 
And this is the history that is best exemplified through immigration through uh, Angel Island. This is in the San Francisco Bay. It's that other island, not Alcatraz, but it's that other island that's in the San Francisco Bay that um, is now a California State Park. So the immigration station on Angel Island was open from 1910 to 1940. We primarily think about it as an entry point for immigrants from China and Japan. And two thirds of the immigrants who did come through Angel Island were from those two countries. But as you can see, there are over 80 countries represented for the immigration stream that came through Angel Island. According to our research, it, it ranged from places like Denmark and Luxembourg, French Indochina, which is the name for Vietnam, Cambodia, and Laos, uh, to South Africa, Spain, Switzerland. There were also folks who came uh, south from Canada and also north from South America. This is a photograph of the administration building on Angel Island. So when immigrants would dock, they would land um, on a pier. They would go up this pier, and this is the first site that they would see. There are three entrances here, and racial segregation was the order of the day. There was an entrance for employees, there was an entrance for whites, and there was an entrance for Asians. And then within that administration building, there were separate waiting areas as well. So at all times, the different um, groups were segregated from each other through um, this administration building. So when we compare it to Ellis Island, Ellis Island is primarily um, enforcing laws that relate to immigrants from Europe, right? It's in New York, and most of the immigrants coming over are coming across from the Atlantic. Angel Island is situated in San Francisco on the Pacific Ocean. It's primarily enforcing laws that are targeting Asian immigrants. And the laws are very, very different. So while Ellis Island is a, mostly a processing center, Angel Island is a place of interrogation, health examinations, and detention. And this history is not as well known, but it's important because it helps shape our modern immigration system. So let's take a look at who these Asian immigrants were. When we think about this great um, era of immigration, there's two great eras of immigration. One is the one that we're living in today, and the other is around the turn of the century, from 1830 to 1930. There are 35 million immigrants who come during this century of migration. The vast majority, 32 million, are from Europe. So this is about a million immigrants from Asia, and another million immigrants come from Latin America. So in the big picture, this is just a drop in the bucket, right? One million out of 35 million who are coming. And it's pretty diverse. There's about 450,000 Chinese. They're the largest group. There's also 380,000 Japanese, 150,000 Filipinos, and then seven to eight to 9,000 each uh, Koreans and South Asians. South Asia is the term that was used to describe immigrants from India, Pakistan, and Bangladesh. So it's a great diversity, not only in ethnicity, but also in terms of numbers. And remember, there's only a million of them. But Asian immigration helps to ignite some of our most divisive immigration debates. So who were these immigrants? The Chinese, they are like the European immigrants that we study. They're mostly young male laborers. They want to come to the United States. They're thinking that their stay is temporary, that they're going to make money, return home. That's why they come um, alone. Even if they're married, they, they tend to leave their wives and children behind. But over the years, they decide eventually that they would like to stay in the United States. So they start calling for their family members. Similarly, the Japanese are also male laborers. So remember, this is a time when immigrants are needed for their labor, right? And it's for 
railroad building, it's for agricultural work, um, it's for light industry, it's for mining. So they want um, unskilled laborers to do that work. So Japanese are also male laborers. They are generally more educated than some of the other Asian immigrants because of uh, compulsory education in Japan. They also come thinking that they're going to stay only temporarily. But over time, again, like the Chinese, they decide that the United States is worth settling down in. And they start calling for um, their wives and fiancés to come as well. So that by World War II, the Japanese American population is such that there's a really great proportion of US born children. This is very different than the other groups. The immigrants who are coming from South Asia are really extremely diverse. There's a mixture of Hindus, Muslims, but primarily they're Sikh, they're of the Sikh religion. And they're from one area in the Punjab area, which is um, present day India and Pakistan. They're both male laborers, but increasingly there's a lot of students who are coming over too. And one of the things that um, makes this group pretty unique is that this is a period of intense um, Indian nationalism and the immigrants coming over at this time are very much a part of that nationalist movement. Koreans are a small group. They're a small group because Japan has colonized Korea by this time. And Japan is um, very much controlling who goes in and who leaves the country. And so only a small number of Koreans are coming over to the United States, primarily to the West Coast and to uh, Hawaii. And they also are coming for work, but more so than other groups, they really see themselves as refugees, similarly to the Russian Jews that we were uh, studying last week. They are fleeing Japanese colonialism, which was extremely harsh and restrictive. Korean language was banned. Korean newspapers were banned. There was lots of surveillance. Um, so they, they see themselves as refugees fleeing their homeland and potentially staying away uh, for a long time. So they come, a higher proportion come as families. One of the other things that makes them unique or different from other Asian immigrant groups is that they're often Christian because of the role of US missionaries, American missionaries in Korea at this time. So it's a really broad, diverse group of people who are coming. The last group are Filipinos. Uh, they also are coming as male laborers. But again, what makes them unique is that they are, they are coming as a totally different immigrant status and not even an immigrant status. The Philippines has been colonized by the United States. So Filipinos, when they migrate, they migrate as what was called as US nationals. This is a different legal category. They're not subjected to immigration laws, which is really important. So as every other immigrant group is restricted, Filipinos can still come without restriction and without those interrogations and inspections. They also see themselves as American. They've grown up with American teachers. They've grown up with American culture. They've grown up believing about the glory and riches of America. And so they believe that they're coming to just another part of the country, that they're already Americans. Um, but they are unequal in status. US nationals allows them to migrate, but they're not citizens. They cannot vote. So when they come, they often face a lot of surprising to them anti-Asian sentiment. So this is the broad diversity of um, Asian immigrants who are coming to this country early 20th century. And when they come, they set in motion the, the reaction that Americans have to them sets in motion some of the most divisive immigration debates that we've ever had in this country. And this may be surprising to many people because today when we talk about Asian Americans, we talk about the popular understandings that they're on the rise, that they're, what's the stereotype of Asian Americans? Smart. They're smart, what else? They're a particular type of minority. Do you guys remember the term? Yeah, tail. They're the model minority. They're the model minority. What does that mean? 
It means that of all marginalized groups, they are somehow exemplary and they constitute a narrative that the rest of marginalized people should ascribe to. Right, so they can succeed, mm -hmm. they can achieve economic success, academic success, and they do so on their own without government programs. So Asian Americans are the model minority. That's the stereotype about Asian Americans today. So it may be surprising that in the early 20th century, they were considered not only undesirable immigrants, but also inassimilable foreigners to such a degree that the United States wanted to not only reduce their numbers, but exclude them altogether. So historian Su Cheng Chan describes this, um, this you know, power of anti-Asian sentiment with this quote. She says, the presence of Asians on American soil highlighted fundamental cleavages in American society, meaning that they were the first non-European immigrant group to come in such great numbers. That they came at a time when there was uh, class tensions, changing race relations, this is post-Civil War, post-Reconstruction, these ideas about what does it mean to be an American, what does it mean to be free, what does it mean to be a worker, what rights do we have, um, and what is the role of the U.S. in the world. All of these things, the late 19th uh, century, 20th century, early 20th century, um, are just rife with all of these uh, massive changes in American society. So some of the ways that anti-Asian sentiment plays out is through prejudice, bias, prejudgments, economic discrimination, barred from certain occupations, political disfranchisement. Remember the 1790 Naturalization Act that said that only free white persons can become citizens, right? And can vote. So already Asian immigrants are barred from becoming naturalized citizens. Physical violence. Immigration exclusion, which is what we're going to be talking about mostly today. Social segregation, you can't join certain clubs, live in certain areas. And then during World War II, incarceration, the mass relocation and incarceration of Japanese Americans. So how did, what did this look like in, um, in person? What did this look like in reality and on the ground? This is a cartoon from 1881 in San Francisco. It's from a magazine called The Wasp. Um, and I'm going to ask you to tell me what you see. What is this cartoon telling us about what Americans think about Chinese immigration at this time? Yes. Well, it appears to be a, a sort of a reaction to what is perceived as sort of this overwhelming number of Chinese immigrants, and uh, this is this, this sort of it is, it's a mockery of the Statue of Liberty, right. but it's also this image of conquest because it's standing on a skull, and it's clearly a, a Chinese man due to the long braid, which marks a lot of Chinese and the fact that he's you know Chinese caricature. Uh, but it's definitely sort of just this mirror image of New York. Good. Okay, so, and what is the, um, what's the title of the cartoon? A Statue for Our Harbor. Right. So. A Statue for Our Harbor. So, in San Francisco, as opposed to New York. Mm -hmm. So, in New York, they've got the Statue of Liberty. It welcomes European immigrants. In San Francisco, this is what our statue would be if we allow Chinese immigration to come without restriction. So, a couple things that Jeremy just mentioned. Um, we can recognize this as a Chinese male. He's got this long queue. This was a hairstyle that was mandated by the Qing Empire, but in the United States it became seen as a sign of um, femininity, of exoticness, of foreignness, of subhumanness. Um, he's wearing robes, but they're very tattered. So this is not the classical Greek figure. It has no dignity, right? He's standing on a skull, meaning that he's bringing ruin. Does anyone see what he's holding in his left hand? Joy? Oh, um, it's an opium pipe. It's an opium pipe, yep. So another symbol um, of the vice of, of Chinese immigration is bringing drugs and immorality. 
Can anyone, so there's writing that is um, emanating from the rays around his head. Can anyone see what that writing is? It's hard to see from the, from the, the middle <laughs> cartoon. The bottom right was filth. The bottom right is filth, yep. Yeah. Then what else? Immorality. Immorality, good. Up on top? Disease. Disease. And then we're going to go, we're reading right to left, as the Chinese would, right? This, um, this one says ruin two. And then can anyone point out those last two? Labor. Yes, ruin two white labor. So Chinese immigration is bringing filth, immorality, disease, ruin to white labor. Okay, catastrophic. Chinese immigration is catastrophic to, to San Francisco, to California. The foundation of the statue is crumbling. The ships that are coming are capsizing. And then um, the, the sun or the moon in the background has slanted eyes. So this is the future of California. This is the future of the United States should Chinese immigration um, come unrestricted. And this is not an outlier. This is not a you know, um, far right or far left or extreme example um, about this, of this anti-immigrant sentiment. This is one of the most well-respected, well-read, illustrated magazines in the late 19th century. So what's the effect of some of this uh, popular sentiment? One is through violence. There are countless um, episodes of the Chinese being driven out, literally being with mobs, driving them out of small towns like Eureka, California, as well as big cities like Tacoma and Seattle. Um, this is a illustration of one of the well-known incidents, the massacre of Chinese at Rock Springs, Wyoming in September of 1885. Uh, it, it happened about um, around a mining incident. Some of the white workers and Chinese workers were debating whether they wanted to go on strike. The white workers went on strike. The Chinese decided not to. And the white workers drove them out after inflicting um, massive violence on this group. So there's about 28 who are um, killed, 15 wounded, and hundreds are driven out into um, the outlying areas. So this is some of the sentiment that is shaping Chinese immigration. But one of the really fascinating aspects of this history is, remember how diverse all of those Asian immigrant groups were. Nevertheless, when this idea of Chinese immigrants as being a threat to the United States, a class threat, a racial threat, an economic threat, um, it became attached to other Asian immigrant groups as well. So that the newspapers would say, Chinese excluded, but now we have a Japanese problem. Or Japanese excluded, now the Hindus are coming. Or the Filipinos. They kept on calling them another Asiatic invasion. So it, it kind of got a little ridiculous because there was the second Asiatic invasion, then the third Asiatic invasion, and it just became this typology that um, that was uh, framing the threat of Asian immigration. And again, it was, had very real consequences. So on the left is a um, newspaper clipping from the New York Times in 1907, 1907, talking about, again, the driving out or the expulsion of um, South Asian uh, immigrants from a little town in Marysville. And this is more troubling, I think. This is a private letter that was sent to a um, townsman in um, California, a, the town sheriff or the town mayor, and it was collected and archived um, at the UC Berkeley archives. This is from the 1930s, so a threat to expel the Filipinos or um, they would inflict violence on the town. Japanese immigration perhaps invoked a more um, broad scale and even international concern. Um, this was called the yellow peril. And it had two elements. One was 
the um, familiar refrain that Japanese immigrants were inassimilable, that they were racially inferior, that they were taking away jobs, that they were mixing with whites. But then the second aspect was more unique to Japan and Japan's rising power in the world. They are an empire. They defeated Russia in 1904. They defeated China in 1894. They've colonized Korea. So there's this um, idea of an Asian empire, Japan's Asian empire, that is infusing that anti-Japanese sentiment with even greater force, that they're even more of a danger because who knows, those Japanese immigrant farmers who are picking your strawberries may be the first advance guard from a colonizing Japan. This was the rhetoric by the 1920s and 30s that Japanese immigrants in California, Hawaii, Oregon, and Washington were actually uh, soldiers in disguise and would be ready to do this. Anyone recognize the artist? says, Dr. Seuss. Okay, what does this say? What does this mean to you? Nineteen forty-two, so that date's significant. <clears throat> yes, Taya. There's an element. There's an element of malfeasance and premeditation with the coming of the Japanese in the cartoon. It implies that they have some sort of connection with the government of their country of origin, and that they're willing to act on the desires of that government should they be called to do so. And how so? What are they um, going to do? blow up something, the little boxes that they're carrying say TNT, so it's assumed that they're going to do some sort of damage. And what about their, the ways in which they're drawn, the number of them? The... There are a number of them and a variety of different um, clothes. They have different clothing, but all the faces are the same, mm -hmm. and that perpetuates the stereotype, the stereotype that all Asians look the same. Mm -hmm. Um, it also, I think, speaks to the stereotype that the Japanese act as a unit, yeah. that they're uniform, and that only contributes to this militarizing portrayal of the Japanese. Good. Okay. So one thing here, so what, what, remember the statue for our harbor? What was the Chinese guy wearing? Is he wearing, like, typical Western dress? Yeah. <clears throat> He was wearing really tattered robes. Yeah, he was wearing robes. So, you know, either they could, you could be seen, it could be read as he's wearing, ro you know, classical Greek robes, like the Statue of Liberty, but they got tattered, or um, Chinese robes. But here, these Japanese immigrants are wearing Western suits. So they're assimilated to a degree. They're Westernized to a degree, which makes them even more of a threat because you can't tell that they're really the enemy within. You can't tell that they're not loyal. But in fact, deep down inside, they're just, quote unquote, waiting for the signal from home. So they're all up and down the Pacific coast, that idea of this yellow peril. And the signal you know, is almost like a, a homing beacon, right? The signal from home is coming. This one guy is looking across the Pacific, waiting for it. It's come, Pearl Harbor has come. Now it's time to wreck even more damage from within. So there's various different types of anti-Asian sentiment. But all of them at its root describe Asian immigrants as not American, always Asian. Immigrants that are dangerous, cannot be assimilated, dangerous for several different reasons, but my, by the 1930s, uh, for Japanese, it's about national security. And then we know that by um, 1942, February of 1942, that Japanese Americans all up and down the West Coast are forcibly removed. So there are exclusion orders that are posted at every street corner in the cities ordering anyone with Japanese ancestry to remove themselves. So they are barred from living in those areas and to um, assemble at various different assembly centers 
where then they will be incarcerated uh, for the duration of the war at several camps throughout the United States. So this is one of the ways in which this Asian immigration story ends. But before we get to that, we want to consider the other aspect, the other path. And that path was barring new immigrants from coming over. So you've been reading a lot about Chinese exclusion, the first act being passed in 1882. What are some of the things that this act does? The name kind of says it all, right? <laughs> but not everything. Not every, not every Chinese ex is excluded. So who is excluded? Yes. Um, all Chinese immigrants, aside from anyone who is a merchant or the children of a native-born citizen. OK, good. So some are excluded, but then there are certain class provisions. So the main group that's excluded are Chinese laborers. So Chinese laborers are excluded. And, and at the very beginning, the Exclusion Act just says for 10 years. So it's sort of like an incremental uh, step. So Chinese laborers are excluded, but like you were saying, there are exempt classes. Teachers, students, travelers, merchants, and diplomats. So it's not only racially based, it's class based. It's those who want to learn about the United States. It's those who want to visit the United States and spend money here. It's those who are engaged in international trade. So again, US-China relationships and economic trade, and of course, diplomats. But those who are the bulk, the vast majority of Chinese at this time, laborers, are barred. It's important because this is the very first time in US history that we bar a group wholesale based on race. Remember when we were talking about the Irish immigration, the anti-Catholic movement, and how even the Know Nothing Party that had a national platform, they never went so far as to advocate for restriction, right? They wanted longer times for naturalization, um, but they never um, said, we're going to close the, the gates. But this time, the United States does do that. And it doesn't just last for 10 years. It gets renewed in 1892. It gets renewed in 1902. And it's made permanent in 1904. And it's really not until 50 years ago that we ban discrimination in immigration law. So it lasts a long time, and it has lots of repercussions. So the Chinese Exclusion Act is just that first step towards closing the gates to Asian immigration. But it would not be the last. So after, this is the irony of Chinese exclusion. Chinese laborers are barred, but this is a time period when 32 million Europeans are still coming over, and labor is still needed. So as soon as Chinese exclusion is passed, Japanese immigration increases because they're still needed in the mines, in the farms, and especially in the plantations of Hawaii. But again, that familiar pattern of anti-Asian sentiment kicks into gear. And by 1908, we also prohibit Japanese laborers. We do not dare call this a Japanese exclusion act, because we don't want to bother Japan. We don't want to insult Japan. Japan, we think of as a, um, an equal nation. And so we pressure through our diplomatic channels to um, have a diplomatic agreement be reached. And we call it a gentleman's agreement, as if it was mutually agreed upon uh, by two equal nations. So Japanese laborers are prohibited by 1908. Again, you bar Japanese laborers. The immigration from South Asia starts to increase. The United States feels like it has another immigration crisis on hand. So the 1917 Immigration Act 
decides to take a little bit more of a drastic approach and basically draws an entire red line throughout all of Asia and calls it the Asiatic Bard Zone. Its primary aim is at prohibiting South Asians. There were only 8,000 coming, um, but still this, um, this law institutes these new restrictions. The 1924 Immigration Act also has a blanket exclusion. The one group that is not covered under the Asiatic Barred Zone is Japan. And even though laborers were barred, others were not. So students were coming over, but especially uh, women uh, and forming those Japanese American communities. So the 1924 Immigration Act is two primary aims is to close those loopholes on Japanese immigration, but also to restrict Southern and Eastern European uh, immigration as well. So then the last group uh, left are Filipinos. And the only way to bar Filipinos from coming to the country is ironically by granting the Philippines independence because the Philippines is a colony and you cannot ban a colonial subject from going from one part of the empire to another. And so we have this really odd coalition of bedfellows, Philippine nationalists who are eager for independence for the Philippines and anti-Asian exclusionists. And they come together and decide this is how we can achieve our goals. We'll grant nominal independence to the Philippines. And by doing that, they're no longer going to be U.S. nationals, but instead they'll be aliens, they'll be foreigners, they'll be immigrants, and they'll be then subjected to immigration laws. So you go from really large-scale immigration from the Philippines, 150,000, to a quota that only gives them 50 slots per year. So these are the laws. So the United States has a problem. As soon as we pass these immigration laws, this is, again, these are transformative. They, we've never done this before. We're not really sure how to enforce immigration laws. So for example, with the 1882 Chinese Exclusion Act, we passed this law in May, ships of Chinese immigrants are coming to San Francisco, and the immigration officials, who are really customs officials, who have just been told, oh, by the way, in addition to counting the barrels of cotton that are coming on that ship, you're also supposed to enforce these new laws. So these custom officials are throwing their hands up and kind of saying, what? You know, what do you, how are we, well, what are these laws and what do you want us to do with them? So remember, Chinese, let's just take the case of Chinese merchants. Chinese merchants can still come. So a shipload of, of immigrants comes into San Francisco Bay. Customs officials goes out to the ship. Which one of you are laborers? Which one of you are merchants? Well, how, how are they going to determine who's a laborer, who's a merchant. This is the beginning of immigration documents. This is the beginning of the immigration interrogation. But what happens if the case is really complicated, that they, the, the merchant, for example, needs two white witnesses to verify their claims? Well, the, those two white witnesses are probably not waiting at the pier. You probably have to send someone to go and get them. And this takes time. So very... Um, soon after these laws are passed, the U.S. government realizes we don't really know what we're doing just yet. We have these immigrants. These, these examinations are taking longer than we thought. We have nowhere to put them. So at the very beginning, they just kept them on the ship. And the ship, cap ship captain would say, it's all well and good that you're using my ship as a detention center, but I have to go back. I'm on schedule to go back across the Pacific to pick up some more passengers. So then they would move those detainees to another ship. And observers in the 1890s talk about San Francisco Bay having you know, these ships moored out in the bay that are basically immigrant detention um, centers. So to solve this problem, there's a small detention shed that gets built in the 1890s. It's crowded, it's a fire trap, it's also not escape proof. And the U.S. government allocates money in 1903 to build the Angel Island Immigration Station on an island, escape proof, 
hard to get to, hard to leave, um, and calls it the Ellis Island of the West. And some of the newspapers from that time are talking about how it's this beautiful resort and immigrants will be so lucky to spend balmy days under the palm trees at the uh, immigration station, but we know that that didn't necessarily turn out to be the case. So here's another irony of this time period. We've passed immigration laws, but immigrants still keep coming. This is not unlike what explains our contemporary immigration patterns. This is why we have an undocumented immigration situation. Even though the laws and the fences and the gates have been built, immigrants still want to come to the United States. So there's several different reasons. We have to understand that during this time period, there's a lot of stuff going on in China, those push factors that we often talk about with immigration. There's civil unrest, there's famine, there's growing numbers of people, population explosion, just like we were talking about with South, um, Southern and Eastern Europe, and especially European and American powers are in China at this time. They're um, instituting unequal economic treaties, they're trying to um, gain more power, especially in this region that's just north of Hong Kong. By this time, so by the time that Angel Island opens up, it's 1910. Chinese have been coming since the gold rush, 1850, that's 60 years. So Chinese families have become dependent on migration as a form of economic survival. And even though the laws are passed, they are still dependent on migration to the United States. So how do they get around the laws is the question for them. And there's this revolution in transportation. So the steamships are getting faster, they're bigger, and fares are cheaper. So at the same time that the laws are being passed, you have steamship agents going out into the countryside saying, I can get you there for this much, and the business um, is still being drummed up. The irony, again, is that um, you have laws that are restricting one group, but the United States still needs immigrant labor. And we know this because the millions of Europeans are still coming in unrestricted. There are some Chinese immigrant groups that we know can still come, merchants, US citizens. So the gate is not totally closed. But all of this leads up to the fact that Chinese either try to come in through those restricted openings, or they try to find other ways of coming in. And this is why we call Chinese immigrants the first undocumented immigrants. And about 100,000 then still come during the exclusion era, or during the time that Angel Island is open, those 30 years, 100,000 come through Angel Island. So this is an interview, um, an excerpt from one of the interviews that you have in your book. And he says that the Chinese didn't want to come in illegally, but they were kind of forced. Jared, would you mind reading this aloud for us? Sure. We didn't want to come in illegally, but we were forced to because of the immigration laws. They particularly picked on the Chinese. If we told the truth, it didn't work. So we had to take the crooked path. Thanks. So what's the crooked path? <clears throat> what's the crooked path that he's talking about? Yeah, Tiago. Uh, was it the uh, paper sons mm -hmm. and daughters. Mm -hmm. So explain that a little bit for us. Um, they would have a family friend or somebody that they knew that would basically just tell immigration that they were family members and they just had to provide a piece of paper. Mm -hmm. So they were sons or daughters yes. only by paper. Yes. And they were getting in under those exempt classes that still allowed the sons or children of say a merchant or a US citizen to come. Yeah. Okay. Does anyone 
recognize this photo or can imagine. Yes, what is it? I really like this photo. Yeah. Um, this was uh, the coaching notes um, because in order to pass interrogation, uh, immigrants would have to study their notes because mm -hmm. they would go through extensive questioning with really, really difficult questions. Um, so in order to get um, notes to the immigrants, sometimes it would be smuggled into food like bananas, or they also talked about like putting it in a little capsule in a bowl of soup. Um, one of the stories also talked about how the kitchen staff would help to pass notes because they would go into the city in San Francisco to get food, and then when they would come back, um, they would hand notes out to whoever it belonged to. So. And they would provide the answers to some of the interrogations. I've also seen notes crumpled up into um, peanuts, <laughs> peanut shells, and also um, oranges. So think about like your best um, efforts at passing a test and, and these strategies here. Let me read to you. So this is a government exhibit, um, the immigration officials found this banana and um, found these notes and then took a picture of it. Um, you can see it all laid out on a kind of a scrapbook and sent it back to, to DC as proof of, um, of the conditions of Chinese immigration at this time. And the um, text, the typewritten text below says, the admissibility of some Chinese persons to the United States is dependent upon the relationship to other Chinese already resident in the country. One of the tests of the relationship claims is a comparison of the statements of the applicant and his allowed relative separately on matters which would be common knowledge between them if the relationship existed. So the two interrogations of the applicant and then the applicant's relative, and then they compare the questions and answers. The exhibits here illustrate one of the methods adopted by alleged relatives to send applicants held in detention on Angel Island coaching information. Uh, contemplated to make their testimony agree with that given by the alleged relatives. The Chinese letter and the village diagram were transmitted in a banana. So here's the letter on the left, and then on the right is literally a map of the village with every resident and details of their allegedly you know, shared village uh, so that they could answer the question. Uh, these were transmitted in the banana as shown, but the trick was discovered before the fruit was given to the applicant. So this is um, some of the consequences of Chinese immigration during the exclusion era. These interrogations, the coaching notes, and also things like this. This is a page uh, taken out of an immigration officer's log in Downeyville, California. Pages and pages of photographs and details of every immigrant in the city. Um, things like Long Bing, Long Bing, he's a cook. Um, changed to Hong Bing by interpreter. Apparently, the interpreter changed his name. He's 50 years, he's five feet, three and a quarter, uh, no mar marks, no facial marks. So you can kind of imagine this immigration officer going up and down the street with his little log and keeping track of all the Chinese immigrants in his town. And they would mark, you know, left for China or uh, returned and so forth. So we've got the beginning of surveillance on immigrant groups. New government crackdowns on undocumented immigration, um, new investigations of fraudulent immigration documents. We have stricter and lengthier interrogations and examinations. We have, for the very first time, we're requiring immigrants to have on their persons at all times what we know today as green cards, but certificates of identity. So for the very first time, we institute these for Chinese immigrants. And if you were found without these, you could be arrested and deported for not being in the country legally. Longer detentions, Immigration raids, arrests, and deportations. There are numerous raids in San Francisco and Boston, around the country, of people, um, immigration officers and local police, um, looking for um, 
undocumented immigrants. I remember specifically <coughs> looking through immigration files in the National Archives and coming across this poor guy's uh, record. He may or may not have come in with fraudulent papers, but the immigration officials were convinced that he was hiding something, so they had an immigration raid that descended upon this Chinese restaurant where he was working. And the text of the report um, describes the immigration of officers coming in through one door and watching him run out the back. He left behind his wallet, which the immigration officers confiscated and put in his file. And you can open it up. There's no money in there anymore, but you can open it up. And it had his business cards. It had um, you know, notes and um, photographs. And so you can imagine you know, that he left in a hurry and um, the uh, fear that he had at that time. So immigration raids, arrests, and deportations. And um, what Chinese called living under the shadow of exclusion, always fearing deportation, always fearing that they would be found out, um, even if they were, or being tainted with illegality, even if they were not. So consequences of the paper sun system. It might have allowed them to enter the country, but it had lots of different consequences. Their fates were held in the hands of immigration officials at Angel Island. This is a photograph of them in the 1930s. You can pick out that there is one um, Asian female employee. She was probably a matron in the women's barracks. And then three um, Asian interpreters. By the 1930s, interpreters could be Asian. When the Immigration Bureau first began, it was against the law to hire anyone who was non-white, even if the job was interpreter, because it was believed that the, the Asians would naturally collude with each other or be easily bribed. And so you had the situation in the 1880s and 1890s with um, the interpreters who were non-Asian, who were white, trying to interpret very um, difficult uh, languages and dialects, not, um, and some of them didn't know all of them very well. So we have uh, immigration officials in Angel Island, and we have interviews in the book that you've been reading that detail that some were very fair-minded. They felt that it was a difficult situation. Um, they tried to give the benefit of the doubt. But we also know that many officials also were hardened. Some were veterans of the anti-Chinese movement, had helped to pass some of these laws, and felt it, that, that it was their duty to keep the gates closed as um, tightly as possible. One of the first things that um, Chinese immigrants had to face was the medical exam. What do you remember from the family histories, the interviews, the poems? What are some of the things that, that former detainees talk about in terms of the medical exam? Yes. Uh, they said that it was very humiliating that they had to undress in front of everybody and they felt like they were being specifically pointed out, especially with the hookworms. Mm -hmm. They thought that it was like a specifically made disease for only Chinese immigrants. Yeah, okay. so humiliation, that they, this was not something that was usual in China to strip down, not only naked in front of the doctor, but in various forms of undress in a group, um, that there are certain diseases that were deemed excludable. There are parasitic diseases. So remember when we were watching the film about Ellis Island, the, the diseases that um, all immigration officials were um, looking for were contagious diseases, dangerous contagious diseases that one could pass to another, right? But these diseases that were being tested for here at Angel Island were not only the contagious diseases, but these parasitic diseases. You know, like when you travel somewhere or you, you know, drink water or food poisoning or, or um, other things, these parasitic diseases that could be easily cured, that were not contagious, but were used specifically to exclude um, immigrants, particularly from Asia, because these certain parasitic diseases were known to uh, be especially prevalent in Asia. 
So you've got the medical exams. And then you have these interrogations. These interrogations that could last a couple hours. They could last two to three days. They could last even longer. The typical um, length was just a few days. But there are some immigration files where if you count the number of questions, it numbers up to 1,000 questions. So this is a, um, a scan of one of these, just one page of one uh, interrogation. And you can just see that it goes boom, 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 boom. What's your name? Have you ever been married? How old are you? When and where were you born? Um, and this particular file, this, these single spaced questions and answers are about six pages, total about six pages long. So I want to do a little exercise with you. I'm going to put these questions up. And I want you to raise your hands if you think that you can answer these questions. And I want you to keep your hands up if you can keep on answering these questions, but then put them down as soon as you think that you have reached a question that you probably cannot answer, that you don't have the true and detailed answer. OK, you guys ready? All right. What is your name? Good. How old are you? What are your parents' names, and what are their ages? OK, easy so far, right? When were they married? Uh-oh. <laughs> OK. Do you have any brothers or sisters? You can raise it up again if you think you can answer this one. What are their names and ages? Good. OK. What's the name of your village? OK, so in this case, how about the name of your hometown? How many houses are on your street? <laughs> OK. Who lives, just pretend, in the third house on the left-hand side of your street and list all names and ages? OK. <laughs> Jeremy's getting into the country. You are neighbors. OK. <laughs> Who's the oldest man in your village <laughs> or home city? And oh, doesn't go. How many steps are there in your house? Or how many steps lead up to your house? OK, so no, you're all out. No one's coming into the country. How many windows does your house have? Not only this, you would have to know the answer, but then like your sister or father would also have to say the exact same thing, right? How many windows does your house have? How many clocks are in your house? How many chickens does your neighbor own? <laughs> What happens if one of them dies in between when you got on the boat and then arrived in the US? You know? um, how far is it from your village to the nearest hill? When were the windows put into your house? OK, so I need two volunteers. I want someone to be the harsh immigration official and someone to be Fang Hoi Kun, who was applying for admission as a son of a native or a US citizen in 1918. Who wants to be my harsh immigration official? OK, Tyler's going to be the immigration official. Who's going to be Fang Hoi Kun? Maybe someone who's sitting close by to Tyler. OK, great. OK, so you go first. You're the immigration official. Which direction does the front of your house face? Face west. Your alleged father has indicated that his house is in Hao Chung Village, faces east. How do you explain that? I know the sun rises in the front of our house and sets in the back of our house. My mother told me that our house and also the Hao Chung Village is face west. <laughs> Cannot you figure this matter out for yourself? I really don't know directions. How many <coughs> rooms in all are there on the ground floor of your house? Three. I mean, there is a parlor, two bedrooms, and a kitchen. There are five rooms in all downstairs. The two bedrooms are together side by side and are between the parlor and the kitchen. 
Do you wish us to understand you would forget how many bedrooms are in a house where you claim to have lived 17 years? Yes, I forgot about it. Do you visit the Sarakara market with your father when he was last in China? No. Why not? If you really are his son. <laughs> Good job. <laughs> So Fong Hai Kun is under pressure, and maybe he misremembers, maybe he trips up, but um, he changes. And this, this is the exact um, record from the stenographer's note. So the stenographer is, is noting, you know, changes or coughs or something like that. So, um, so this kind of, this is a, you know, kind of typical back and forth, but... If I was Fang Hui Chan, I'd be nervous, um, scared, and um, perhaps by the end of this, a little, a little angry. So we know from oral histories and others that these interrogations were terrifying. And this is um, a quote. Some of you have read La Shi Lo's story in Island. This is a picture of her on her wedding. She was detained in, on Angel Island in 1922. And she told interviewers that um, one woman was questioned all day and then deported. She told me they asked her about life in China, that chickens and the neighbors and the direction the house faced. How would I know all that? I was scared. So what this translated to, these, in, these long interrogations, um, calling back and forth of witnesses, waiting for people to come from San Francisco or Oakland or sometimes, you know, from the interior of Idaho, um, coming to San Francisco to give testimony was that the um, detentions were quite long. This is the only photograph that we have of what the barracks looked like inside um, around 1910, extremely crowded conditions. Um, between 200 and 300 men were housed at any time in the barracks. Women were detained elsewhere um, on the second a floor of the administration building, and on average their stay was two to three weeks. They are let out um, for one hour a day, and this is what they have. So that's why there's, you know, your cot is your living space. This is another quote from Li Puyo, who was um, detained for 20 months. So one of the things about Chinese immigration during this time period was they were very active in challenging their denials. They hired lawyers, and they would take their, course, their cases up through court in Lee Puyo's case all the way up to the Supreme Court. And she talks about how um, she must have cried a bowl full of tears on Angel Island. So how does this compare Ellis Island to Angel Island? We know that there's around 12 million who come through Ellis Island during its period of operation from 1891 to 1952, that 20% of all immigrant arrivals are detained. So those are the women and children who are arriving to join their husbands. They need to wait until their husbands and fathers come and, and um, retrieve them or those who are being tested for those um, contagious diseases. So 20% are detained. But it's not for long. Detention time is one to two days on average. And in the end, 98% are admitted. So this is why we think of Ellis Island as more of a processing center going through. The numbers are much different. Just half a million come through Angel Island. So the scale is, is quite different. But we see the differences right away, too, with detention. 20% on Ellis Island, 60% of all immigrant arrivals are detained on Angel Island. Instead of counting detention times in one to two days, they count them in weeks, months, years. The longest detention time is 756 days. 93% of Chinese are admitted. So that's much higher than one would expect. But 
it's only after these long detentions and after really lengthy legal battles that are, of course, expensive as well. We know so much about the Angel Island experience because of these poems that have been preserved. And this one is the best preserved poem. The author must have carved it over and over again. And this one fits with many of the themes that you all have written about already. From now on, I'm departing far from this building. All of my fellow villagers are rejoicing with me. Don't say that everything within is Western styled. Even if it is built of jade, it has turned into a cage. Immigration officials thought that um, the detainees were just writing graffiti on the walls, since they would paint over and over and over. But these two guys, Tet Yi and Smiley Jan, copied more than 100 poems into their notebooks in the 1930s when they were um, detained. And it's because of those poems that we've been, been able to preserve um, so many. So I've chosen three, and I, I'd like three volunteers to help me um, help us read these and also help us think about um, what they mean. So who would like to be the first one to read this poem? Yes, thank you. There are tens of thousands of poems composed on these walls. They are all cries of complaint and sadness. The day I am rid of this prison and attain success, I must remember that this chapter once existed. In my daily needs, I must be frugal. Needless extravagance leads youth to ruin. All my compatriots should please be mindful. Once you have some small gains, return home early. By one from Hung Shan. Thank you. So what are some of the messages here? There's a couple at least. Yes. Well, I count some I concentrated on this poem um, within my mm -hmm. response um, and compared it to uh, La Shi Lolus experience. Mm -hmm. um, something that I thought was interesting is that within this poem it reflects, I must remember that this chapter once existed, which I think is really contradicting to most of the immigrants' experiences at Angel Island because it was so detrimental. Uh, I'm sure it's something that you would want to forget. Mm -hmm. um, where La Shilo definitely, to me, had this humility where it's something where she came out of it very strong and was like, this is a chapter I, I need to remember because it's going to help me be a strong woman and provide for myself and my family in such a difficult era in the United States. So I thought that was interesting. Good, good. So even though it might be a, um, um, an experience that they would like to forget that the multitude of these expressions on these walls, the tens of thousands of poems, the complaints and sadness um, that I must, that we must remember that this chapter once existed. What about the second half? Uh, in my daily needs, I must be frugal. Um, once you have some small gains, return home early. So what is this immigrant's plan? Yes, Tyler. I see a linkage to maybe referencing the ex extravagance of American lifestyle mm. in, in contrast to um, this person's homeland back in Asia. Uh -huh. And his plan may be to probably return once they can establish themselves and yeah. maybe make some money. Yeah. So not to stay, but to return. And probably that this experience on Angel Island has helped them convince themselves that the United States is not a welcoming place. So once you earn enough, return home early. OK, who would like to read this one? Thank you. Imprisoned in the wooden building day after day, my freedom withheld, how can I bear to talk about it? I look to see who is happy, but they only sit quietly. I am anxious and depressed and cannot fall asleep. The days are long and the bowel constantly empty. My sad mood, even so, is not dispelled. The nights are long and the pillow cold. Who can pity my loneliness? After experiencing such loneliness and sorrow, why not just return home and learn to plow the fields? Thank you. OK, so what are some of the messages here in that first, in the first stanza? 
Yes. Uh, the detention center on Angel, Angel Island was uh, very bleak. Just the environment and it and the long detentions and this environment caused a lot of its detainees to become uh, emotionally depressed mm. and probably chronically depressed, judging by the uh, counts of suicides. And uh, many questioned why they came in the first place. Mm -hmm. Which us. goes right into the second stanza, too. Then, um, after experiencing such loneliness and sorrow, just give up. Why not just give up and learn to plow the fields? So coming with lots of hope to the United States, this experience um, changing them and causing this loneliness, despair, so much, uh, so much so that he cannot bear to talk about it. Um, and just really questioning why they came to the United States in the first place. Okay, last poem. Last volunteer. Yeah. Oh. I clasped hands in parting with my brothers and classmates. Because of the mouth, I hastened across the American Ocean. How was I to know that the Western barbarians had lost their hearts and reason? With a hundred kinds of oppressive laws, they mistreat us Chinese. It is still not enough after being interrogated and investigated several times. We also have to have our chests examined while naked. Our countrymen suffer this treatment, all because our country's power cannot yet expand. If there comes a day when China will be united, I will surely cut out the heart and bowels of the Western barbarian. A little bit more complicated than the other ones, a little bit more passionate. So. What are some of the, the messages here? Yes. Um, it illustrates immigration as a necessary process. It definitely gives testament to this notion that immigrants come out of necessity, mm -hmm. that they don't choose to come simply for fun. And he uh, references political instability in his country as to why they're here. and. Yeah, that's... Political instability and um, global inequalities, right? Our countrymen suffer this treatment all because our country's power can, cannot yet expand. So one of the things that I think is interesting about this one, first of all, is it is um, more pointedly angry, resentful, and threatening of violence than many of the others. Um, and it explicitly pits the, at least on this, in this case, the Chinese against the so-called Western barbarians. And it's very important that he, and we know that these, these are all poems that have been recovered from the men's barracks. We know that, um, that they're male. He's using that term barbarian because that is what they had been called themselves. That is what the Americans were calling Chinese, uncivilized barbarians. So by putting this back on the Americans, it's, um, it's even more pointed. And then this last line, if there comes a day when China will be united, I will surely cut out the heart and bowels of the Western barbarian. So quite, um, quite a strong statement there. The history of immigration on Angel Island, one chapter ends in 1940 when a fire destroys the administration building. This is where all the interrogations happen. This is the, the barracks of the um, women's, um, where the women detainees would be. And for the next 30 years, the place is abandoned and it's actually scheduled to be demolished. And this is what the men's barracks looks like in the 1970s. So in many ways, it was a history that was lost. It was lost because detainees themselves did not want to remember it. They, were, they identified this era, this period of, of uh, immigration in their lives as being under the shadow of exclusion. They didn't talk about their experiences even to their own families. So there are many family histories that you've read where the children are saying, we were told never to use our real name, or I didn't even know that Yong was not my real name until X, Y, and Z. And Paul Chow, who was the, um, one of the um, leaders who helped to preserve the Angel Island Immigration Station, talked about how whenever he brought up the words Angel Island to his family, he would just hear, shh, don't talk about it. 
Also, in the 1960s, immigration history was not yet a recognizable field. The immigrant was not yet studied. And this history was not well preserved. But through the efforts of many community activists and discoveries, we first were able to discover, preserve the poems because a California state park ranger found these poems when he was going through uh, the barracks. He told his professor about it, a biology professor, whose mother just happened to have been a uh, detainee on Angel Island. And that professor told other faculty and students in, uh, at SF State's newly created Asian American Studies Department. And they were inspired to study the poems, preserve them, do the oral history. So the three authors of the book that you're reading were not uh, professional historians. Him Mark Lai was an engineer. Jenny Lim was a poet. Judy Young was a librarian at the San Francisco Chinatown branch. And they took it upon themselves to go into the community to conduct oral histories to translate the poems. And this is what the book looked like when it was first published in 1980. Publishers, publishing houses did not want to publish it, so they self-published it um, 35 years ago. And what they found was that this history, that preserving and recovering this history served as a type of catharsis for the Chinese American community. It openly aired these dark secrets it allowed people to understand that they didn't experience this on their own, that there were others who experienced this history of racial exclusion and undocumented immigration. It helped to feel like they could let this go, that it wasn't all their fault, that it was part of a larger history, a larger pattern of discrimination. It helped to legitimize the Angel Island experience. And it allowed immigrant detainees to feel like they didn't have to be ashamed anymore. So Judy Young talks about how in this early period in the 1970s, she would find people to interview and then they would politely say, no, thank you, I don't want to talk about it. Now, there are so many people who want to tell Judy their stories that she cannot keep up with them. It has become a whole new type of um, experience. And it's not just for the Chinese American community, but it's been recognized as important for all Americans. So then in 1998, the Angel Island Immigration Station became a National Historic Landmark. And the rationale behind that comes from the um, community organization that helped to put this movement forward. And they said in their, in their proposal, Angel Island, the Angel Island Immigration Station presents the first, the only, and the best opportunity to fully interpret the history of Asian immigration to the United States. This is our Plymouth Rock, our Valley Forge, our Alamo, our Statue of Liberty, our Lincoln Memorial, all rolled into one. In the same way that Ellis Island has been enshrined as a national monument to commemorate European immigration to America, Angel Island, should be recognized and declared a National Historic Landmark. And this is a photograph at that, um, at that signing and at that um, ceremony in 1998. There was a massive effort um, since then. There has been a massive effort to raise money to restore the building. So this is the um, men's detention barracks that's been fully restored and has turned into a museum. On the footprint of where the administration building sat is now an open space but exhibits like an interrogation table with photographs. They've restored um, the interior of the men's barracks as well. This is what it looked like um, at its uh, reopening in 2009. And there are now documentaries that help to explain the preservation of poems, that preservation process, and the new discoveries that have been found. In the years since these efforts, there have been 200 poems that have been 
uh, rediscovered. There's been um, hundreds of inscriptions in many different languages, including Punjabi, German, um, English, um, Spanish, Japanese. And there's also been um, carvings, illustrations, carvings that have also been um, restored. There's also been new research, so a new edition of Island with new family histories and new poems and another book on Angel Island that looks at a broad range of immigration through the immigration station as well. So all of this has led to what some could interpret as a closing of the chapter on this history of Angel Island immigration. In 2012, a group of community activists lobbied for the passage of a statement of regret in 2012, a statement of regret that, um, that Congress regret, regretted the Chinese exclusion laws. And specifically, this statement of regret acknowledged, so it's important that it's not an apology, it's a statement of regret. It acknowledges that the Chinese Exclusion Acts, quote, resulted in the persecution and political alienation of persons of Chinese descent, unfairly limited their civil rights, legitimized racial discrimination, and induced trauma that persists with the Chinese community today. This has been an important um, landmark event, a uh, type of reconciliation, this public acknowledgement that Chinese exclusion happened, that it was detrimental, that it did not um, coincide with our, um, our political beliefs. And this was an important um, um, event, an important transformation in that history. But I'd also want us to question whether it's really time to close that chapter. Does a simple statement of regret help us um, put it into the dustbin of history, let us forget about what happened, move on, think about other immigrant histories, happier stories. You know, what are the lessons of Angel Island today? There are diverse groups of immigrants who came through the immigration station. Not all of them were detained. Not all of them um, might have had this experience of wanting to cut out the bowels of the Western barbarian, but many of them did. And while we often point to, say, Ellis Island and its celebratory history of immigration and our making of a nation of immigrants, I would argue that this other history, this darker history of immigration through Angel Island, perhaps has even more resonance with our contemporary world today. The poems describe um, frustration, disappointment, <coughs> anger, resentment of the immigrant experience, and it helps us to confront America's history of discrimination in restriction in immigration laws. And as we know, this is not a story that we can just safely leave to the early 20th century. These are two photos and headlines that were taken from the news just this past summer when Central American refugees, many of them, most of them, children or mothers, were coming across the border to the United States for asylum. And for many weeks, we did not know what conditions these young immigrant detainees were being housed in. But a few weeks into it, um, we were able to find uh, and get some, some sneak peeks, some, some pictures. So this is just one photograph of the um, processing facility in Brownsville, Texas. It can be argued that we're in a current state of immigration detention crisis. So let me just read off a couple of numbers for you. In 2011, the Department of Homeland Security held a record-breaking 429,000 immigrants in over 250 facilities across the country. So 429,000 people, immigrants, are, were detained in 2011. That translates into about 33,400 33, beds a day. 
and advocates argue that the majority of these detentions are not actually necessary. So remember that um, detentions on Ellis Island were about one to two days. Detentions on Angel Island, as hard as they were, um, averaged into the two to three weeks. Today, incarceration periods range from 37 days to 10 months. So we have 300,000 immigrants who were detained on Angel Island over the entire 30-year period. Compared to, in 2011 alone, this is the most recent statistics, 429,000 in one year. So it's been 50 years since we've passed comprehensive immigration reform. We're celebrating or recognizing or honoring the 50th anniversary of the 1965 Immigration Act. And it's clear from those headlines that I showed at the very beginning that we're in a current debate over immigration uh, about which there does not seem to be any easy solution. So how do we connect this to Angel Island then? I would argue that Angel Island represents the best and the worst of America's immigration history. There are many, many immigrant families, including my own, who can trace their roots back to Angel Island and have made it through the educational system and can now celebrate generations of being in the United States. But there are many others for which that detention experience best mirrors this other side of immigration that we're also experiencing today. So I want to end by reading from the Angel Island Immigration Station Foundation. This is the organization that dedicates itself to the preservation and education about immigration through Angel Island and through the Pacific Coast in general. It collects and preserves uh, the rich stories of, of immigrants both through Angel Island and, and elsewhere and also um, and does a lot of education and outreach. And it says in their mission statement that Angel Island reminds us of the complicated history of immigration in America. It serves as a symbol of our willingness to learn from our past to ensure that our nation keeps its promise of liberty and freedom. And if you want to learn more, we can go to the Angel Island's um, website. It has an amazing arrange an archive of immigrant voices, many of which are um, uh, based on the collection of family histories and poems in the book that we've read, but also there are more coming in every day. So thank you so much. That's it for today, and we'll see you next time. Thanks for listening. Please rate, review, and subscribe to this podcast wherever you get your podcasts. We would love to hear from you. You can email us at podcasts at c-span.org.